Hi, my name is Christina Galvan. I am currently attending Fielder Church. I have been going here for off and on, maybe four or five years. Mi nombre es Miriam Cotten y tengo aproximadamente seis meses asistiendo a Fielder con mi hija, su esposo y mis nietos. My name is Hefty and I've been married for a few months and been working here at the church for a little over four years. En nuestra primera reunión me encontré con personas muy amables. Nos recibieron con mucho amor. Nos dieron la bienvenida y se pusieron a nuestra disposición. I actually talked my sister into going with me so I didn't have to be alone. And when I got there, I kind of thought, oh gosh, you know, I don't know these people. They don't really know me. Last summer, uh, my girlfriend and now wife found out we were pregnant and it was just so frightening. Um, we felt so isolated. We felt like we were gonna be just left in the dust, completely abandon us, and we were gonna have nobody. En realidad he visto el amor de Dios a través de todos ellos. Nosotros pasamos una situación difícil en familia y ellos fueron un soporte tremendo. Como si nos conocieran de toda la vida, nos apoyaron en todo. Turns out that we actually all kind of have a lot in common, which is funny, but then when you think about it, you know, God always has a plan and everything works out accordingly. We may not be in the same stages of life, um, but that's the cool part of community group that everybody can help each other no matter what stage you're in. Um, I may have gone through something that somebody else is just going through. Somebody else has gone through something that I haven't been through. Um, and we're just there to uplift each other and to be there for each other. They became um, pillars for us to lean on. Um, they became the gospel to us. You know, they reminded us of the gospel and of Jesus' unconditional love. It's just been so fulfilling to me. Ellos han sido un instrumento para que nosotros nos sientamos parte de la familia. The true community of, of believers um, is formed uh, just like the church, you know, to be a place uh, for, for sinners to come and find the heart of Christ. Hey, Fielder Church, I'm so glad we're going to get to worship the Lord today. We have a special honor to have Gary Smith, who's going to be delivering God's word to you this morning. He was, if you don't know Gary, the lead pastor of this church for 25 years when he and I passed this off about four and a half years ago. So such an honor to still have him come and share God's word with us as he continues to help us chart our way through 1 Timothy. And so you're going to want to tune in. You're going to get your heart ready for how God's going to speak to you today. A couple more things I want you to know about. You may not realize this, but you have an incredible opportunity to get the word and the gospel out through our social media accounts. And so if you're watching this on YouTube, you may not have yet subscribed to YouTube. I want to encourage you to take a moment, subscribe to YouTube. You go ahead and like like the service, if you do these types of things, it'll actually show up on other people's feeds more regularly. And so your interaction with our YouTube channel will be so important. So take the time right now to do that. Also on Facebook, uh, you may not know how the algorithms work, but they'd actually, you know, you, you're looking through Facebook and some things show up and others don't. Well, the reason they show up is because there are people who like the services, people who share the services, and so you have a part. What I'd love for you to do right now is if you are on Facebook, to go ahead and like the service, not just individual comments, but the service itself. Make sure you share it right now. If you're watching this on some other channel, or if there's only one device and you got a number of others, all of you get your phone out right now, go to Facebook, like the service, share the service, because the more we do this and interact with this, the more we get the word out. Also make sure you like the Fielder Church page on Facebook. All these things help us spread the good news of the gospel. So take the time to do that right now. A couple more things I want you to know about. I know a lot of you have been asking, okay, when are we gonna get back together again? Well, we're still praying. We believe that in uh, June we'll begin phase three. And so we're gonna start having watch parties in our campuses. We're gonna start giving you more information about that in the days ahead as we try to figure out how to keep everybody safe, how to come together again. But it is just on the horizon. Be praying for us and we are so excited to be with the church body, whoever's able to come starting in June. 
One last thing I want you to be aware of. If you were not a part of the live Q&A or Wednesday Night Live, we had this past Wednesday, we had an incredible panel where we talked about an intense issue in our country right now. The fact that there's still, it appears, this latent racism and this racial tension in our country, and we spoke into that. I, Pastor Ender, from a Latino perspective, we had Pastor Reggie, uh, who spoke from an African-American perspective. We also had Pastor Ronnie Goins in our city, who leads a large African-American church. Pastor Marty at Rush Creek, Pastor Jeff at North Davis, and it was just a, a Q&A to ask and interact with people, and so if you didn't catch it, you can go on Facebook, look back at Wednesday, go to Fielder Church's page, and you can see that and see how the Lord is allowing us to enter into this conversation. Now, each week coming up, we want to have a different Q&A as long as we're still in this virtual world, but we would love to know what topics you would like to discuss, so right now whether you're on YouTube or on Facebook, if you wouldn't mind, drop us a comment. I would love to hear a live Q&A on X. Could be finances, could be marriage, could be parenting, could be on something totally different we're not even thinking about, but you can actually lead us to the next Q&A. So give us your thoughts. I'd love to know what you'd like us to do. One last quick thing, make sure you get your Lord's Supper supplies ready because we're gonna take that at the end of this service and we are gonna honor God. We're gonna introduce a new song today to you and it is a song of deep worship. So God is gonna move and I pray you prepare your hearts. I cannot wait to worship with you this morning. I'm Jennifer Swafford, been at Fielder for 10 years. I'm part of Bo and Lauren Cooley's community group. I became a trainer in 2016 after being a participant for two years because I started to see that this was a ministry. Once you're out working on the pavement, you're suffering together with people, doing push-ups, you start to really get into life with them. And I just saw an opportunity to pour into people um, and use this fitness platform really to love people and invest in their lives. And that drew me to become a trainer. We get all kinds of people at Camp Gladiator. It gives people a great place to connect. So we get young people, older people, single, divorced, young families, a lot of moms with special need kids that don't have another place to connect, uh, police officers, firemen. We get people going through all stages of life. Sometimes they're going through um, a divorce struggle, a health struggle, they have health limitations. Really, anything they're dealing with, they're gonna find a place to connect when they come out to camp with us. We, we really get it all. So we had one, um, one woman that I met out in an event and invited her to come out. And as I got to know her, I noticed she was really reserved, really standoffish from our, our group. And she began to go through some life struggles, went through a divorce, went through the loss of a job. And I was able to reach out to her, help meet some of those needs, connect her with other campers, start to build friendships, found her a job, kind of walked her through that struggle time that she was going through and then eventually through relationship and through that year um, get involved in a bible study together be able to share my testimony with her be able to take times in my life that have been um, even times of shame a time of me being a single parent of me growing up not a believer and now i can use those as a blessing to say here's what god did did with me in that season of life, I know the Lord is gonna bless you with it. And so this person that was very closed down to the gospel is now having an open heart to it because of this community and because of the, the openness to it and because seeing a community of believers just love her 
in a really inclusive way day after day and meet her needs and make her one of their own, essentially. And so that's just one of many ways I feel like we're able to do that for people out here. I started a Bible study because I really wanted to get more intentional with sharing and just open a door for people that maybe aren't comfortable coming into church. So I started that Wednesday nights and I get a real mix. I got about 12 people signed up, but it's always different ones who come each Wednesday night. And uh, that's been a big blessing because when it's only one or two people, we're able to study our lesson and I can share my personal testimony. And that's been nice for people that haven't grown up with a faith or they're questioning their faith, they feel real comfortable to say, these are the issues I'm struggling with right now. And that's how it's been. We've been doing it all summer. I'm gonna keep it going continually. We'll just make um, a couple nights out of the month. That's our Bible study night. And I wanna expand it even bigger. It's just been women. We've been meeting at my home and a couple different restaurants. And it's just a time for fellowship and to get to know each other on a deeper level and to be able to pray for one another and know what's going on in our lives. And it's been, it's been rich, it's been awesome. The Lord um, has blessed it and made a way for it. And even though it's, it's starting small, it's something that the whole community knows about and is asking about and wants to find a way to get involved with. Here's one way you can pray for me. I really want to, um, I want to shine for Jesus and um, I just want, I pray for me that I do that well. Pray for me that, um, that, I, that I serve and use the gifts that he gives me well to reach people in a way that, that changes their hearts and leans them always towards him and points the glory to him. Last year, a small group from Fielder visited Cucuta, Colombia, a city bordering Venezuela. What they saw stirred their hearts to quickly move to help the people of Venezuela. Venezuela's economy has crashed. Over the last few years, over four million Venezuelans have left their home country. They're looking for hope. The people cross to Colombia with what little money they have, if any, hoping to get a destination where they can find jobs so they can provide for their families. Many of them walk for weeks looking for a solution to their problem. Cucuta is one of the major crossing points and a place that opens the door to the rest of the world. However, many of them need help in that city so they can continue on their journey and not be extorted by those preying on the vulnerable. They need help not to get stuck in an endless cycle of poverty. Colombia has opened their doors to Venezuelans, but they need our help. This is Casa de Paso, a small shelter on the border of Colombia and Venezuela, providing food, showers, and a place to rest, and even medical assistance to immigrants in need. Most importantly, hope is being offered. Casa de Paso is sharing the gospel with those who come through their doors. Tiene para como un faro un faro que se enciende cuando hay un tiempo oscuro. Eso apunta a, una, a, un, a, un, a un resultado final. Nosotros sabemos que una persona que oye el Evangelio del Señor Jesús, el mensaje de transformación, donde llegue lo va a comunicar. Y cuando se empieza a comunicar el Evangelio, el reino de Dios empieza a extender por todos los rincones del mundo. Hoy a reminder que Christ shines through the darkness and still hears their cries. Casa de Paso is just that, an answer to their prayers.
Hey, Fielder Church family, I want to welcome you to the service today. Hello to all of those of you who usually attend the Grand Prairie, South Oaks, and Pioneer campuses. We are so glad that even though we're scattered across this city, we are able to gather together for worship this morning. But maybe this is your first time joining us or, or your second time. We are so glad that you are tuning in with us this morning. But we would love to know that you're joining us. So if you haven't done so already, you can let us know that you're here by taking out your phone and texting the word next step to the number 94253. Or you can go on our website, fielder.org slash next step. There's a short little survey there and one of our pastors will reach out to you and help you get connected to Fielder Church. So thank you for taking the time to do that this morning. So if you have been joining us, you know that we're in the middle of a series going through 1st and 2nd Timothy. And this morning we're going to pick up right where we left off, going chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And Pastor Gary is going to be bringing the word this morning. So I would encourage you to grab your Bible, grab a notebook, and engage with us this morning. So our hope is that this service would encourage you, you would be comforted by the words, and that you would be refreshed to trust in Jesus more this morning. And we hope that by the end of this service, you would know without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus loves you so much and he wants a personal relationship with you. So that in itself is enough for us to rejoice. So let's kick off this service this morning with worship. Well, good morning, Fielder Church and guests. We're so grateful that you've chosen to be with us this morning. We know you have thousands of options right at your fingertips, but the fact that you've chosen to be with us, to worship with us, blesses us so dearly. But let's turn our heart toward the Lord and His love for us. Let's pay attention to who He is. Would you join us as we sing about Him? Yeah. We sing it like this, as the daylight breaks, as the daylight breaks, you're lighting up my way. You're lighting up my way. My soul awakes. My soul awakes. To give you all the praise. To give you all the praise. I will trust in you. Oh, I will trust in you. I will keep praising you through the night. They say to me, I believe in you. So I praise, and so I praise. Jesus, I will give you praise. Doesn't matter what may come at me, I believe in you. Yep, yes I do. God is so good. Let's talk about the story. You're taking all my fear. You're taking all my fear. Filling me with hope. Filling me with hope. I know you're there. I know you're here. Wherever I may go. Wherever I may go. Oh, I will trust. I will trust in you. I will keep praising you. Through yes, I will. I put my hope. I put my Shake my faith hey. And so I praise Jesus I will give you praise Doesn't matter what may come at me I believe in you We sing this together I'm holding on I'm holding on I keep believing No matter what I keep on singing every chain because every chain you are breaking so my heart will keep on praising
doesn't matter where you are, if you're alone in your room or if you're with your family. Can you give a shout of praise to our God? All right, church, y'all sing with me. We raise our hallelujahs in every situation. Come on right here. I raise a hallelujah. Come on. In the presence of my enemies. And I raise a hallelujah. Come on, it's louder. Louder than the unbelief. Come on, sing it over yourself. Here we go. I'll raise a hallelujah. This is how we fight. My weapon is a melody. And I'll raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Come on. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm.
Praise the hallelujah in the middle of the storm because the victory is in our King's hands. And that's the truth that we can sing all week long. Why? Because Jesus cares for us. We know how much he cares for us because as we read through the gospels, we see how much he poured out his life for others. Even for you and me right now, the fact that he went to the cross. But his love didn't stop when he returned to God. His caring didn't stop when he returned to his father. Romans 8, 34 even shows us that he's interceding on our behalf. That's a king that cares. He's petitioning for us. He's defending us. He's battling for us. Man, what great comfort. I don't know about you guys, but I want to worship. I want to love a king that would care so much about me, that it would turn his eyes toward me. King Jesus, thank you so much for having this unconditional love for us. My prayer, my deepest prayer is that we would love you. We would long for you. We would desire you all the days of our life. In Jesus' name.
Can you just meditate on him? Just long to worship him. He's so Just posture yourself right now and just receive his goodness. No one like my God. No one like our God. this moment he is breathing his breath of blessings upon you. Would you receive it? It's his gift to you. Only a king with riches and abundance can give freely. A king that holds so much victory in his hands. That's your Jesus, that's your God, that's our King. So if you receive that, would you just say yes and amen? Let's sing about his victory.
to Timothy, my true child in faith, may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father be upon you. Timothy, I urge you to stay in Ephesus. Charge certain persons to cease preaching a different doctrine. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. Always devote yourself to the public reading of scriptures, exhortation, to teaching. What you have heard from in front of many and trust to many as well who will too teach others. I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead. Preach the word, be ready, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with complete patience and teaching. My dear Timothy, may the Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Grace be with you. Open your Bibles with me, if you would, again to 1 Timothy chapter number three. Just want to tell you how much I love worship at Fielder. I love the energy that you feel whenever we worship together. I've been studying recently out of the book of Nehemiah. After they had done so many great things, they brought in the singers. And man, did they celebrate it. And I'm so grateful to be in a church that knows how to celebrate. And also is committed to the Word of God. You listened with me last week as Jason in Virginia great, did a great job teaching us from the Word of God. And, and we watched that couple that God's appointed as leaders in our church and, and do such an incredible job uh, helping us understand a very difficult passage. Of course, over these years, I've wondered where Jason gets these great sermons. I've come to understand Virginia's been writing the sermons, all right? What a great message, Virginia. What a great lady you are uh, that helps your husband in leading this church. But today we're going to be looking at something very special out of 1 Timothy chapter number 3. It's by God's providence that this Sunday falls where it does in the uh, religious and church calendar. You may not realize this, that next Sunday is what's called Pentecost Sunday. It is the Sunday that we use to celebrate 50 days or seven weeks or so after uh, Easter in which we celebrate Pentecost. Now there's two very significant things that happened at Pentecost. First of all was the coming of the Holy Spirit and we saw the transformation that happened there. But we also got to realize that it was the birth of of the church. It was the church being birthed. Now I use that word birth for a very specific reason, because very often we think that the church just was set down, equipped and ready to go uh, from the very beginning. I use the word birth so we would understand that just like in our lives, whenever we brought our first child home from the hospital and we realized that child didn't have everything, it had to grow and had to mature in the same way, we discovered that the church had to do that. The structure and the organization, all that happened in the early church was something that was a growing process, just like a child matures and grows. And we are gonna see today that, that the church in the beginning thought that Jesus was going to come during their generation. And so they didn't give a lot of attention in the early days to organization and finding out how the church acts in the middle of its life, in the middle of its circumstances. But we see in the third chapter that you have this young man, Timothy. He's in Ephesus, a city that God has moved mightily, but there he has a large group of believers. And suddenly they're realizing that, that they need to have the church going in some right directions organizationally. And we'll understand there's some accountability in that process. But what we discover in this is that God gives us some certain principles that these principles are timeless. And we're going to look at those timeless principles out of the third chapter of 1 Timothy. The first principle is the church needs leadership. You've got to understand there's never been anything that's ever been accomplished without leadership. When God wanted to deliver the folks from uh, uh, Egypt, the people from Egypt, what did he do? He brought a leader. When he wanted to conquer the land, he brought a leader by the name of Joshua. God's always given the church leadership. And we see this in this third chapter. It says, this saying is trustworthy. We're going to read the first seven verses. If anyone aspires to the office 
of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer, and I like this word must, must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, should not be a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Shouldn't be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit, fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he might not fall into disgrace into the snare of the devil. What the Bible says is the church needed overseers. It needed leadership. And they began to realize they needed someone who could manage the life of the church. And that's what you find in this word right here, uh, um, uh, overseer. It is a word that speaks about something that is managed, that is directed uh, for the congregation. And so what the Bible would tell us very clearly is from the beginning, the church realized that it needed leaders. Now you say, well, wait a minute, Gary, this word uh, overseer right here in some places is translated bishops. We don't have bishops in our church. What's going on in that kind of situation? Well, you have to realize these words used to describe the leadership in the church doesn't specifically so much give them names for offices, but gives them functions and shows to describe what the responsibilities were to be in the life of the church. In fact, if you turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5, it takes various terms to describe the leadership of the church. It says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder, a witness of the suffering of Christ, as well as a partaker of the glory that's going to be revealed, shepherd, that's pastor, the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. There's that same word that we looked at, not on a compulsion, but willingly as God would give you, not shame for shameful gain, but eagerly. What it does in this text is it uses three different words to describe the role of the leadership, describe the role of the pastor. You say, well, Gary, which one is he? Is he the pastor? Is he the elder? Is he the overseer? Is he the bishop? What goes on right here? What, what these are, these are descriptive terms that speak of the role of the pastor of the church and the elders that assist him in leading the church. Let me maybe picture it like this. Uh, in my own life, as you look at me, you see me as Gary Smith, but you don't realize that I fulfill a lot of different roles. First of all, I'm a son. I'm the son of Mary and Tommy Smith. And so they saw me as a son. And in that family, I functioned as a son. But then also I'm a husband. I'm a husband to Sandy. And so, yes, I'm a son, but I'm also a husband. And those two roles are different. But then also I'm a father. I have three children and I'm a father to those three children. And they see that role in my life. And, and that word father is a descriptive role. And, and praise God, I'm a granddad. I, I got six grandkids and I fulfill a different role for them, but it's the same person. Well, that's what the Bible says about the leadership. It says the leadership has different functions but it all resides in one person. And some people get caught up upon the structure of what this word means and putting those in order and all those things. I'm convinced that the Bible is just describing to us the leadership of the church and how the leadership of the church function and that that role has a variety of ways that it is lived out. Now, not only that, the Bible tells us that this person is someone who should be a visionary, should be a leader. When you look at this word overseer used in our text today, it's not someone who just sits on the sideline and watch it, watches it happen. Someone who's a leader, someone who's a visionary. And as I've studied organizations, whether it's the church or any other organization, something never goes anywhere without a leader. And the church is never going to go anywhere without a leader. I know I've worked with a lot of different churches now and the kind of role that I fulfill in life. And it's very easy to look into churches and see when they don't have a leader. They have a chaplain, a person who's a nice guy, a guy who knows how how to pastor people and love them. But as I understand the church, it needs leadership. Someone with a vision, someone who hears from God, someone at the church puts in a place of wanting him to hear from God so that he can give the church leadership but it's also something that has a calling to it. There's a word used in this text that if you aspire, anyone aspires to the office of overseer. That word aspire, it speaks of something that comes out of the soul. 
What it means is that when God wants the church to have leaders, he doesn't just say several people apply for this. What he does, he calls someone to that place. And that person feels it within their soul. That aspiration is not something they did because they want the job. It's something that God has done to bring them to that place. That's the reason why the church follows that leadership. This is because God has called them to that place. But also as you look at this text, you realize that this person should be a person of character. When we read through those verses, you realize there were character issues. But the main issue that describes those character issues is the word, the phrase above reproach. What it means is, is when it asked him to be sober-minded and self-controlled, respectable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, all of those terms are speaking about his character. Now, it's not saying that he has to be someone who's perfect. None of us but Jesus has ever done that. But it just means he's above reproach in those areas. And it means that no one could be able to look at his life and see that there's some place that he's controlled by those things. But it also describes his family life. <laughs> you know, I'm so thankful that it doesn't say, well, he's just got to have a perfect little family and everybody does everything exactly right. No, it uses a phrase right here called managing. That word manage right here speaks of someone who finds himself in a family and that family has a lot of variety of circumstances and situation. And the leader of the church learns how to manage his family. I believe this text is saying to us is that that's really the proving ground, the testing ground, the growing ground of his leadership. And you watch his life and you say, wait a minute, your family doesn't have to be perfect, but it ought to be obvious that that person is managing his family and is a person who is managing what is happening in the life of his family. But also it says that it should never be a novice. It says right here, be careful. It's not someone who, uh, who is a novice in the things of God, but has maturity. But it also says it should be someone who is respected by people within the community. Then not only does he function within the church with character that puts him above reproach when he lives his life out in the community, the community sees his life being lived in the same way. Now, what you realize when you look at these words is you understand that there is a calling to this ministry place, but there's also accountability. And one of the things that's very, very important in the life of the church is that it has leadership, but also that leadership has accountability. You show me a church without leadership, I'll show you a church going nowhere. But you show me an individual without accountability, and you'll find someone who will go in the wrong places because there's no accountability within their lives. You say, well, Gary, how in the world do you do that in, uh, in the church today? Well, when I was in my very first church, about 130 people attending every week, had seven deacons. They held me accountable. We met every month and, and they let me know what I was doing right and what I was doing wrong. And that accountability was very obvious. But you know, in a church like Fielder, how in the world do you ever describe something like that? But we can't have business meetings like the churches used to have and that, that won't work. And, and we know that doesn't happen. Sometimes in churches, deacons fulfill that role. We have a hundred or so deacons. They can't fulfill that role. What our church saw in the wisdom to do several years ago was form a pastor's advisory council, and something you may not even know exists as a church member, but that's the group of people that create the accountability for the pastor. It is those five people that you elect every year. Uh, one rotates off every year, and that's the person that you hold responsible for accountability in the life of the pastor. He is the one who looks at these. They are the ones who look at these qualifications and make sure there's accountability in the way that he's living. And the way that we operate at feel or praise the Lord is, is there must be a unanimous assent within uh, consent within those folks for the church to move forward in any large area. Now they don't sit around and discuss the color of the paint in the bathroom, but they take the bigger issues of life and they join hands together and give the church leadership. One of the things I love about Fielder is over its uh, many years of history, the church has learned how to balance giving leadership, but also having accountability. And that's one of the reasons why God's done great and mighty things through the life of this church and will do great and mighty things in the days ahead because this church has understood what it is to have an overseer, an overseer who has accountability. But then as you look at the life of the church, you realize that not only is there the need of people who are giving it leadership, 
that right in the center of all it does must be servanthood. That is why you find in this next section of scripture, the establishment of the office of deacon. And that is to magnify the fact that the church has got to have servants. It says deacons, verse number eight, likewise. Now, by the way, that's going back to those same qualifications of the leader of the overseer. Likewise must be dignified, not double tongued not addicted to much wine, not a greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of faith with a clear conscience and let them be tested first and let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. There's that same word blameless that was found with the overseers. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. Look at verse 13. For those who serve well as deacon gain good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Now, where did this idea of deacons come from? Well, if you go back to Acts chapter six, we believe that the forerunner of that came whenever the church, it says in those days, the very first verses, they were increasing in number greatly. A complaint arose by the Hellenists against the Hebrews because the widows were being neglected in their daily distribution. Well, the 12 summoned the full membership of the disciples. And they said, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve the tables. Therefore, pick out from among you seven men of good report, full of the spirit and wisdom, that we may appoint to this duty. But we'll devote ourselves to the ministry of the word and, and that pleased them. And they gathered seven people and they, verse number six, they set before them the apostles, then before the apostles, they prayed and they laid their hands upon them. What you begin to see from the beginning is as the church began to grow and multiply, as the ministry's church began to be something that was expansive, they didn't want those who were the overseers those who were teaching the word, those who were giving spiritual leadership to the church to be involved in something like waiting the tables and taking care of the widows. And so what they did in that day is they established what we know as the office of deacon. Now, I want you to know, many of you have been in churches where the role of the deacon has been all over the place. As I told you, in every church I ever served in prior to coming to field, the deacons carried an authority role. My first church, they served as quasi-elders and, and they did that. That was because of what was needed in a small town where the pastors were coming and going very often. But as the church expands, like Fielder has expanded, you want to give the leadership the freedom to give leadership. And so the church needs deacons who understand servanthood. And so you begin to see that the pastor and the deacons take on a partnership of the uh, pastors giving leadership to the church, but also the deacons coming under them and saying, we will do whatever it takes to be able to help you in ministry and to be your assistant. Now, in every church I've been in, it's been a variety of things. When I lived in Oklahoma and we had a lot of ice storms, every time it would snow and ice storm would come, you know who would be at the church scraping the ice away? It'd be the deacons. Well, I, I would always say about them, they scratch where the church itches, but well, you say, well, what did they do at Fielder? Well, at Fielder, we have a lot of ministries that our deacons carry on. And one of the very first roles of the deacon officers every year is to go to the pastor. Say, how can we help you do ministry? Our church has over 125 widows and they care for the widows within the life of our church. They, they visit the hospitals and they carry on those kinds of ministries that, that are the ministry daily task of the life of, uh, of the church. And the church cannot function without that kind of person. Now in this text, it describes for them that they're to people, be people of character. Doesn't just say we have a leadership group that has character. It says also the deacons are people of character. It also says that their family is a proving ground for that that they prove themselves in the life of their family. And you look for men who are managing their own household well, and those people become those who lead, not by giving oversight to the church, but they lead by giving servanthood in the life of the church. And they lead the church in that kind of servanthood attitude. Now you say, okay, Gary, you jumped very quickly over verse number 11. That's a verse that's been somewhat controversial in churches. It's a verse that, by the way, just like the verses we looked at last week, have a variety of interpretations in some places. Some believe when it was describing in verse number 11 that, that about the wives, that, that it would fulfill one of three possibilities. 
It could be, first of all, the wives of the deacons, and in the same way, the wives of the deacons uh, should be qualified like them in their character and who they are. Some people believe it was a separate office called a deaconess. Uh, some believe Phoebe in the Bible was a deaconess. Others believe that it was a special category of helper. It was a role that men cannot fulfill in the life of the church. It roles that the wives have special gifts for. It's the reason why in the church that, that the wives have such a special role in the life of the church is because there's gifts they have that men can't even get near. The church would never be able to function uh, if it was a, just a male organization. What it needs is that balance that the female brings to the life of the church and, and, and the ministry that she brings alongside with her husband of servanthood. As you look at this text, our church has primarily felt this was the office or place of the wives. But I would be honest and dishonest, I'd be dishonest if I didn't say to you that as long as the deacons are fulfilling a servant role, I would see no place, I would not disagree with those who would make this an office that uh, are fulfilled or, or a category of helpers. Uh, what this is saying is that God's calling servants, not looking for gender, He's looking for heart, looking for someone who's willing to give their life for the ministry of people and the servanthood of the church. And the church cannot make it without these servants. All you have are leaders. You have a church that's headed off, but it's headed off by itself and never makes a difference. God gave the church this servant heart and servant attitude that is so essential to the life and the ministry of God's church. You say, well, Gary, so that just means you guys who are in the pastoral role, you're the big dogs, and then the rest of us just kind of sit around and wait tables, and, and we have uh, such a menial role. I don't agree with that at all. It's not at all what I'm trying to say. In fact, as I've looked back through my life in ministry, I've thought about the deacons that I've watched give great leadership by their servant spirit in the church. The very first one I ever saw <clears throat> was my father-in-law, Delmer Jackson. He and his wife, Catherine, ministered to the church. And they were there in that day when the church was meeting five or six nights a week and, and meeting on Sunday night and doing all these things. I watched them serve the church and give their lives faithfully to that. I, I can remember the first church I served in right out of seminary. I was having to commute my last semester back down to Fort Worth and never forget a man by the name of Bill Duncan walking up to me and saying, Gary, I, I know you don't have a lot of money and I, I know you've been in school a lot of time. He gave me his credit card. He said, you use this credit card to, to go back and forth to school. I gave it back to him about two years ago. No, I, I hadn't kept it that long. But, but in reality, that deacon saw a need gave me that credit card, ministered to me so greatly. I remember in my first pastorate, guy by the name of Leroy Waugh, his wife was named Kathy. Wow, what servants. That church, if you were to ask them what has made the life of their church, they would, they would go first to Kathy and Leroy Wall. Not people with a lot of wealth, not a lot of income, not a person who's a great speaker, just a man and a woman who serve God's church and minister to God's people and they do whatever it takes. The life of the church lives on servanthood. Then I remember one that's been very special in my life, a guy by the name of Bill Meadows. In my life, when tragedy hit our house and our son passed away, I never forget when I was lost, and didn't know where I was going, I'd get a phone call from Bill Meadows. And he'd always say, preacher, he'd say, preacher, I'm coming to get you. And I knew what that meant. He'd come by in his truck. He'd have his truck, his saw. We'd go out to his property. And we'd spend a couple, three hours cutting wood and take the wood to my house. And I can remember one day I looked at Bill and I said, Bill, what are you doing? And he said, well, he said, I just want to help you, Pastor. I know God's called you to lead this church, and I know you're hurting. And I know my role is to put my arms around you and serve you and serve the kingdom of God. You need to know, church, you're always going to see the name on the sign. That's the preacher. But you always know it is the servants that make the life of the church, make the difference in the church being able to go where it needs to go. But then this last section of Scripture... Whenever I was first assigned this third chapter, I even went to Jason. I said, Jason, I wonder whether these, these last verses fit with these other verses because it talked about overseers and then deacons. But then as I began to read this last section, I realized it very much fit with it because what it did is it talked about the general populace of the church has some accountability. God doesn't just hold the overseers, bishops, pastors, 
accountable for what they do and not just the deacons, but there is some accountability throughout the life of the church that is the responsibility of every church member. Look if you would, beginning in verse 14. Paul said, Timothy, I hope to come see you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you might know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and a buttress of truth. What he's saying right here is there's a behavior for all of us. And that word behavior is an interesting Greek word. It describes our manner of conversation, our manner of lifestyle. And you study in church history, you discover the reason why the church exploded was not the great preachers. It was because the world saw the transformation that happened in their life. They saw specifically the behavior of the people who were in the household of God. And they realized that they did stand for truth the things of God. And that was something that was very important to them and that the church did that. But it wasn't just an intellectual truth. It was the fact that they learned how to behave and where that behavior came. You say, well, Gary, where does it come from? Well, it describes in the next verses. Great indeed, we confess, is this mystery of godliness, this mystery of how we ought to behave. But what it does is it points us to Jesus Christ. It says he was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world and taken up for glory. What it's saying in this text is that we who live in the church, we have an accountability too. It's not just the leadership that is supposed to live a certain way and the rest of us can do what we want. The rest of us can live like we want. There is a standard of belief, but there's also a standard of contact and conduct, a behavior but that behavior, where does it come from? Does it come from a set of rules that we get or a set of regulations or some, somebody's written down a few things that every one of us is to do? It says in this text that the mystery of godliness is when Jesus Christ is lived out through our lives. That's the reason why it's so important to inhale the gospel because we inhale these things about Jesus, someone who was God in the flesh, Someone who was vindicated by the Spirit when he rose from the dead. Someone who was taken up to glory and one of these days is coming back. What does that say to you and me? It says to you and me that whether we're an overseer or a deacon or someone who fulfills any place within the life of the church, we have a responsibility to reflect Jesus in everything we do and that our behavior would be a testimony, not that we're a Baptist or we're in the church or we have an office, but we be a reflection that the Son of God, the one believed on by the world, has come to live within our soul, live within our lives. And so our behavior becomes a reflection of who He is and what He is, and an indication that our lives are in relationship to Jesus Christ is that our behavior then reflects the life of Jesus Christ. And I'd ask you today, have you possibly tried to live the Christian life without Jesus? Have you tried to be everything that you think you need to be and you find yourself you can't get there and you try and obey what you think God would have someone to do and just isn't happening in your life? Well, could it be the reason why? You're trying to do something in your life that only God can do in your life through Jesus Christ. And what is missing in your life is not a set of rules. It's a relationship with the Son of God, the one described in these verses, the gospel, because when the Son of God comes to live within your life, then you begin to experience the life of Jesus in that relationship. And that relationship becomes lived out, not just in your words, not just in your knowledge, but in the behavior of your life. And you will discover the mystery of godliness. The fact that it is a mystery, how having Jesus within your life will transform your life. That is why every week we take the Lord's Supper. And right now you can go get your elements for the Lord's Supper. Because what we're celebrating is we're celebrating this Jesus that gives life to all of us, whether it's as an overseer or a deacon or any other place within the church. It becomes our lives. And so when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we do that as a thanksgiving for him coming to live within our lives so that, that our behavior would be an expression of godliness. And so in just a moment, you're going to take the Lord's Supper as you do that. 
Let it be a testimony that you want your behavior to reflect Jesus and a testimony that he's come to live within your life and you want him to live that out through your life. So let me pray for you and let me pray that as you live your life, your behavior would be a reflection of the life of Christ, a reflection that the world would see. And as they see how you live, they would want the same Jesus that you have within your life. Father, we thank you today for the life that we can have in Jesus Christ. We thank you today, Lord, that, that we're not required to keep a set of rules or do a bunch of things that, that are difficult to do to have a relationship with you. We're thankful because Jesus Christ died upon a cross and gave his life for us that we can now have him come to live within us. And as he lives within us, we can let him live that life out through us. And as that life is lived out through us, we can every day celebrate your presence, but also find that our lives are transformed by that presence. And Father, whatever role we have within the church, as an overseer, as a deacon, as a deacon's wife, as a woman who has a special role in the life of the church, or Father, any other place within the life of a congregation, that you would find within us the life of Christ being lived out for your glory. And Father, today, as we celebrate the Lord's table, let us do it focused upon the one who has transformed our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
But the truth is you're building your life on something. Right now, you're basing your entire life on, on some pillar, some truth. And what we're just saying is, God, I'm gonna build my life upon your love. Just as you heard Pastor Gary talk about, this mystery of godliness flows from one simple truth, that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. He died on a cross. He rose from the dead. He was seen by angels, vindicated by the Spirit. He is the reason why we have life and hope and faith. And there is no greater symbol of that than the Lord's Supper. And so hopefully you've all had a chance to grab the bread. I want you to each take a piece of this bread. Just share it with every single believer who's there with you right now. And this bread, this bread is symbolizing the very body of Jesus Christ, that it was true flesh, that he was a real human being who, who was crucified, who was sacrificed so that you and I could be saved. We're building our life upon that love. Let's do this in remembrance of him. And what a truth, God. But it didn't stop with just the bread. We move on to the cup and we look at the fruit of the vine with that deep red color that reminds us of the blood of Jesus Christ. And over and over, every single week we take this, my mind is drawn right back to, to my Savior who is covered in his own blood, giving it up so you and I could be saved. There is no greater love than this that someone will give up his life for his friends. And he calls you friend and me friend and says, I've given my life for you, shown in the blood, but you're made new by this blood. Let's take this in remembrance of him. Oh God, we rejoice in the truth of the gospel of Jesus. We proclaim Jesus' death every time we take the Lord's Supper because we know that when he returns, that our salvation is found in the fact that he died and rose again. And so God, I pray that you would feel us today with the presence of your spirit as we have celebrated the good news of the gospel of Jesus by taking the Lord's Supper, by hearing your word preached, by worshiping you, by building our life upon you. And may the, the very fragrance of the aroma of Christ be with us all week long, God, as we serve you. Today, as we Sabbath and we rest, may we be renewed entirely by you and your love. And God, we love you because you first loved us. Go with us, be with us. We're here to serve you. It's in Jesus' beautiful, holy name that we pray. Amen. I hope your eyes were filled with wonder and you saw and believed in Jesus more deeply this morning and that you know that his love is a firm foundation that you can build your life on. So right now, I want us to continue in our worship of God through expressing our gratitude to him through giving and practicing radical generosity. So whether or not this is your first time giving or maybe you're a regular giver, you can pull out your phone and give online right now by texting the word FIELDER to the number 77977. Or you can go online to our website, fielder.org slash giving. Thank you so much for how you are generously giving, even in this time with the pandemic. We are so grateful for your radical generosity. So thank you again for tuning in to the service this morning. We hope to see you right back here next week, and we long for the day that we get to see you in person. So I'm going to pray for us and then send us out. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this morning and the time that we got together to worship. Lord, I thank you for the, the homes that have opened up for watch parties and they're gathered together. Um, Lord, I thank you that you have touched so many hearts this morning with the gospel. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that many today would make you Lord of their life. Lord, we know um, uh, you're able to do far more abundantly than we could ever ask or imagine. And so we're asking you to do that in the lives of our families watching this morning. We love you. Um, it's in your Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Field our church, you are sent. <laughs>